Thank you all. Thank you all. And is the audio working on your end? Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for having me and giving me the chance to speak via the, the video link. It uh, uh, certainly works out well for me, Australia. I regret it's a bit of a long trip. Um, and I'll apologize in advance if you hear uh, car alarms or thunder in the background. Uh, the car alarms, I happen to live in, in Manhattan in New York City, so sometimes we have those. And the thunder, there also happens to be a, a thunderstorm going on this evening. So uh, it's, it's uh, 3 a.m. New York time now, but I'll, uh, I uh, still look forward to presenting. So I'll be speaking about nuclear war risk uh, for, for my talk. And I'll be sharing actually uh, three stories about nuclear war and uh, my own involvement in this topic. Uh, and each of them has a plot twist that has certainly changed uh, my thinking and, and my activities on, on nuclear war and uh, probably a lot of other people as well. Um, and so I would say, while the, the focus is on nuclear war, uh, probably the overarching theme is the value of flexibility uh, such that uh, when circumstances change, when we learn new things about a topic, we, we have the flexibility to uh, uh, adjust our activities on it. So it's both the, the intellectual flexibility to think in different ways and also the, the institutional flexibility uh, so that we can, we can follow up on that as, the, as we learn more and as the, the issues change. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll go ahead and start with the first story, which is about risk analysis. Now, risk analysis, this is how I first got involved in uh, the nuclear war topic, uh, specifically through uh, my colleague, Tony Barrett. He and I got a project to work on what's called inadvertent nuclear war. And so we, we did the model for uh, the risk of inadvertent nuclear war. And then uh, we also did a, um, so, so uh, just to, to clarify, inadvertent nuclear war, this is when one country uh, uh, misinterprets a false alarm as a real attack and then uh, uh, launches nuclear weapons in what it believes is a retaliation but is in fact the first, first strike. And there have been a number of occasions over the years where maybe something like that came, came close to happening. Now, uh, uh, we, we've done that, and then we've also done a, uh, a model for the total probability of nuclear war. And by the way, are the slides showing up on, on your end now? Well, yeah, we're, we're seeing them, but we see them in the context of um, a development view. It's, yeah. Okay. But that's well, okay. Uh, see them. For for now, as long as you can see the slides, I guess that's that's that should be. yeah we we developed we did a a model of uh, the probability of nuclear war covering all different types of of nuclear war, uh, including inadvertent as well as when uh, countries intentionally do a first strike attack. Uh, we also did a model of uh, the nuclear war impacts uh, going into the the five major types of impacts of nuclear war. Uh, thermal radiation blast, ionizing radiation, electromagnetic pulse, and then human perceptions being like the, the psychological and, and political reactions that people can have. And um, you know, skipping through a lot of detail here because the, uh, the detail of the model is not the point I want to make, but actually uh, the, the point is that you know, despite having done all this work, we actually have not been able to really pin down in much detail what the probability and the, the severity of the impacts of nuclear war are. So, for example, with the inadvertent, oops, with the inadvertent nuclear war model, we uh, quantified the probability of inadvertent nuclear war between the United States and Russia, and we found, depending on the assumptions, the probability would fall between once in 14 years to once per 5,000 years or once in 20 years to once per 100,000 years, which suffice to say, that's not really narrowing it down all that much. Um, and so, and this is just because it's uh, a fairly difficult risk to quantify. Uh, nuclear war, it's not like it's something that happens very often. There's you know, formerly only been one, which was World War II, and that was you know, many years ago under fairly different circumstances. And uh, so it's, it's not an easy risk to quantify. And one consequence of that 
is for say policy implications, it doesn't uh, give us much guidance, at least, at least not yet. So for example, one of the most important policy questions with nuclear war is with respect to nuclear disarmament. And broadly speaking, there are four different disarmament camps. There's actually a small group of people that argue in favor of more nuclear proliferation. These are people who really believe in the effectiveness of nuclear deterrence and see that as a way of uh, preventing war. Uh, a more common view uh, among a lot of hawkish people would be to just maintain the status quo indefinitely in which some countries have nuclear weapons, but most don't. Then um, another large group favors gradual disarmament over many decades. And finally, a lot of non-nuclear weapon states uh, support a much more rapid uh, nuclear disarmament. And despite having studied the risk of nuclear war over many years, I actually don't know which of these camps that, that I support. I mean, at the core of it is a trade-off between the frequency and the severity of major wars. So nuclear weapons would make the severity of war much larger, but they may make the frequency of war uh, uh, smaller in the, okay, I don't think nuclear deterrence is perfect, but it does at least seem to be more effective than conventional deterrence. It's deterrence without nuclear weapons. And so if we were to get rid of nuclear uh, weapons, at least under present circumstances, there's a good chance we would be seeing major wars more often. And so there's this trade-off between the frequency and severity. And thus far, I don't actually know what the, the balance of this lies and what that means for nuclear disarmament policy. So that has been uh, the first thing that has really prompted me to think differently about the nuclear weapons topic. And that brings us to our second story, which is on international relations. Now, if you were to ask me a few years back uh, what the best thing to do about uh, uh, reducing nuclear war risk, I would say to try to improve international relations, especially between the countries that have nuclear weapons and their close allies. So for example, there was a really fascinating project by Dorothy and Martin Hellman in which they uh, took a very introspective look at their own marriage and used that as a starting point for uh, rethinking international relationships, uh, relationships between countries. Really a creative, uh, uh, a very, very smart project, I thought. And this was, had some good ideas for how to improve international relations. They had some emphasis on a uh, relationship between the United States and Russia. Well, then within the last two or three years or so, the world has changed. The, the geopolitics of, of our world just looks different now than it did, say, four or five years ago, such that if you were to talk about, say, improving the relationship between the United States and Russia, well, right now, that looks a fair bit different than it did, say, five years ago, uh, and, and so too for, for other countries. And you know, this has been a, a major struggle for me in that you know, I had this great idea for how to reduce nuclear war risk, and now it just it, it doesn't make as much sense anymore. And you know, I, I know this is all you know, important, how the, the world has changed, but uh, you know, I, I, I try coming up with ideas for what to do about it, but I'm not sure if these ideas are any good. I mean, there's an idea like, maybe we could take what we've learned about effective foreign aid and apply that to uh, make people less interested in immigration in the first place, which has been you know, immigration, one of the, the big drivers of geopolitical turmoil in recent years. Or uh, you know, take ideas from public philosophy, uh, getting people to, you know, care more about different people around the world and use that to, to reduce nationalism. Uh, I could see a, an important role for uh, a country like Australia to really take a lead in trying to stabilize the, the present circumstance. Or alternatively, maybe the best thing to do is just wait until the current moment runs its course and you know, then pick up where we left off potentially, it's assuming that it does in fact run its course, or maybe the best option is to, to focus on other issues instead. I, these are just some ideas, but I, not, none of them really stand out as especially compelling, which has been uh, frustrating for me. And uh, this brings us to 
our uh, final story, uh, when we think about focusing on other issues instead, should say a little bit about nuclear winter, uh, which for me was really the uh, one of the main reasons uh, to be concerned about nuclear war in the first place. Now, nuclear winter, this happens uh, as a, an effect of nuclear war in which uh, the burning of cities sends a lot of smoke up into the atmosphere. Uh, some of it will go high up into the atmosphere into the second level of the stratosphere, spread all around the world, block incoming sunlight, uh, cool temperatures at the surface of the planet, and you know, uh, disrupt agriculture and cause other, other problems. And the effects could be quite severe. I really like this quote. This is from Alan Robach, who's one of the leading nuclear winter researchers. He says, although extinction of our species was not ruled out in initial studies by biologists back in the 1980s, it now seems that this would not take place, especially in Australia and New Zealand, humans would have a better chance to survive. It's kind of funny because if you think about it, if we're only saying humans would have a better chance to survive, that means we still haven't ruled out extinction. Uh, and I would say, no, we haven't ruled out extinction. And it's very difficult to do so because this is a very uh, uh, uncertain, un unprecedented phenomenon. Uh, but uh, at any rate, the, the prospect of either extinction or some other very uh, severe catastrophe has uh, uh, given me a lot of reason to, to study nuclear war and nuclear winter specifically. And likewise, this has been uh, a big focus for my own work on uh, nuclear war as you know, shown by uh, the, the publications listed here. Then a few months ago, a research group from Los Alamos National Laboratory in the US uh, published a paper on the physical science of nuclear winter where they did some fairly detailed modeling of the firestorms that would be produced by nuclear explosions and how that would uh, affect the, the atmosphere and in turn the climate. The uh, picture here shows one of their simulations. And the big thing that they found is that in contrast with previous studies, actually relatively little of the smoke would make it uh, up into the second layer of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, up past the, the tropopause, which is about 12 kilometers up. Then in fact, about 80% of the smoke would stay in the troposphere, which is the lower level. And by staying in the troposphere, that means that it can relatively quickly get uh, washed out in the rain. Stratosphere is above the clouds, and so it could stay up for a much longer period of time. And as a consequence of that, the uh, total amount of smoke would be uh, cut by about a factor of five. So if the, the earlier studies would say for, say, a, a hundred weapon uh, nuclear war between India and Pakistan, you might end up with about five teragrams of smoke uh, in the stratosphere. With this, you might only end up with one teragram of smoke. And so especially after, uh, say, a year or so after the war, uh, a very large portion of it would now be back out of uh, the, the stratosphere. And this means that the cooling effect would be much, much uh, reduced. Now, this is just one study. It's, it's quite new. We're still wrapping our minds around it. But to me, it looks like this could mean that nuclear winter is actually not at all as important as we previously thought it was. Still maybe somewhat important, especially for, say, a larger war between the United States and Russia, uh, but not nearly as important as it otherwise would be. And my immediate reaction to that is to think, okay, maybe I am going to now place more emphasis on uh, my work on other risks besides nuclear war. I uh, did some work uh, some years ago on climate change and geoengineering, also artificial intelligence, um, and then most recently a little bit of work on nanotechnology. Uh, perhaps this will become more important if this uh, new study holds and nuclear winter ends up not being as important. And this really speaks to, I would say, the, the value of flexibility to be able to switch from one topic, one issue area to another, uh, be able to, to do the work and also, uh, you know, institutionally with the, the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute, we're set up to work across a range of different risks and, and that's been uh, very valuable in this circumstance. I'm, I'm glad that I did not find myself in a position where I was pretty much stuck on one issue that, uh, while the jury is still out, could end up not being quite as important. And so to summarize, 
risk analysis still can be useful, but maybe uh, uh, most useful only for select circumstances. International relations still important, but more complicated than they were a few years ago. Uh, nuclear winter may be about five times less important than we used to think it was. And then as, as stated, flexibility, uh, very important, both intellectual uh, and, and institutionally. And I'll stop there, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Seth. Um, now we're just going to move to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and so I'll just bring that up. All right. So um, we've got a top question here at the moment, which is asking, do you think we need a global coercive power, such as like a UN with teeth, et cetera, to solve the nuclear problem? I don't think so. It's an interesting question. So in the early days of nuclear weapons, there were uh, talk of doing just that, of having uh, uh, nuclear weapons and, and nuclear energy be under uh, United Nations uh, supervision. It's called the, the Baruch Plan. Now, that didn't take off. Um, but uh, looking at it now, I don't think we need that. I think it is uh, feasible enough for uh, the countries, if they're really committed to it, to uh, eliminate nuclear weapons on their own. I would say instead, the really the main limiting factor is still going to be the relations between the different countries. We have some untangling to do at the moment. It's going to take uh, some time. Um, but I would say if that can be addressed, then the rest should be able to fall into place. OK, excellent. Um, now, uh, we've got a question here. So um, could you uh, elaborate on your current position on immigration? And in what way does it have an impact on geopolitical turmoil? Sure. Now, I'm not really a specialist uh, uh, on immigration, so this is just my own kind of uh, superficial take on it. But I would think best case scenario is that conditions around the world would be good enough that people would not be so desperate to, to go to other countries in the first place. Uh, it's, you know, this is not a a matter of xenophobia, just, you know, from, from their perspective, most people would tend to uh, at least have the option of, of having a nice life in, in the country that they know and, and grew up with. You know, I'm certainly glad that I'm able to have a, a nice, comfortable life in, in the United States. Uh, and I think that's, that's pretty normal. And so, I mean, that's, that's of, of course, much easier said than done. But to me, that, that seems like that should be the end game that we should all be working towards. And then if we can get there, of course, there will still be, still will be immigration, but it will be on a much smaller scale and under uh, much more favorable circumstances seems uh, much man uh, more manageable if we can get there. Okay. Um, we've got another one here that's asking, um, in light of the new evidence that you presented, do you think uh, nuclear war still meets a definition of an X risk or, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. I would say it, uh, first of all, may depend on uh, one's definition of existential risk. Uh, and there are two major definitions floating around. One is, uh, you know, risk to existence, a risk, uh, uh, basically a human extinction risk. And the other is uh, a risk of basically like large and permanent harm to, to human civilization. Um, so first for human extinction, I still think that um, uh, we can't rule it out, especially for a U.S.-Russia uh, nuclear war that, okay, if we're only getting a uh, five-fold reduction in the, uh, the smoke in the, the atmosphere, it would still be a fair bit. Uh, and so I would still worry about it. I would worry uh, less than before, but still some. And then for uh, long-term damage to human civilization. Yeah, I, I definitely see that as being a, a possibility. Though I will say um, the long-term effects of catastrophes that leave some survivors is, in my view, the, the largest and most important point of uncertainty uh, across all of the catastrophic risks. Will there be a, a good recovery? Uh, will we rebuild civilization? Will we you know, keep civilization intact in the first place? 
I feel like we still don't have very good answers to, to those sorts of questions. And so until we do, I think we need to err on the safe side and uh, continue to be concerned about um, uh, uh, these sorts of risks. All right, excellent. Um, now we've probably got time for just one more question. Um, and we've got a, high, uh, a highly voted one here, which is asking, um, how does the rise of new cyber technologies um, affect the risk of nuclear war in the future? It does. It, the question is in the future, but I would say it actually already does right now. Uh, we don't know for sure because that information is classified, but there are hints, for example, of uh, the United States uh, hacking into the uh, nuclear weapons uh, systems of North Korea that maybe a few, few years back when North Korea had a string of uh, missile launch test failures, uh, that maybe we had something to do with that. Now, more recently, they've had some successful uh, test launches. So I guess there's, there's maybe a limit to that. Uh, but there, uh, this may already be a thing. Uh, and the, the biggest way that this could be an effect uh, uh, be a factor is in getting into the, the command and control systems, the systems that uh, are both uh, uh, sensing whether there's an incoming attack and then uh, making and distributing and executing the decision to launch if one is made, which could uh, you know, have some, some uh, harmful implications. Like if somebody can commandeer another country's nuclear weapons and start launching them, uh, especially like uh, rogue actors, terrorist groups might might like to do something like that. Or alternatively, kind of the best case scenario is countries still think their nuclear weapons work, and so they feel deterred, but they don't work such so that in case deterrence happens to fail, we don't have to deal with the, the, the messy actual nuclear war. That would be kind of the best case scenario. Um, but uh, the bottom line is, yeah, this is this is definitely... Uh, definitely a factor, definitely something that's being taken very seriously and, and with good reason, I would say. Amazing. Um, thank you so much for your time, Seth. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's been great to have you as our last speaker for the conference. And um, can we, can everyone please put a round of applause together for Seth? <laughs>